All right, so today we need to talk about your corporate social responsibility, uh, critical thinking challenge. And did I tell you, did I say that you guys could have some time at the beginning to finish that up? Is that what I told you? You just said in class, so. Okay, so how much time do you all need, do you think, to finish so that you can talk about corporate social responsibility and Walmart intelligently? How long do you want to go walk around for? Uh, 55 minutes? No, really, like how much time do you think you all need? What's a good time for you to walk around? What's your normal route when you go walking out there? That's what I want to know. Do you like... I can, I can give you, I can give you, if you want to take the whole hour, I could give you the whole hour. And we could talk about it on Tuesday. <laughs> now, I mean, well, like 20 when minutes. you say that, 20 minutes? Is that going to put us behind? Can you do that? No. So, I mean, what you're saying is, like, we should probably just, you know, you could go work on whatever you need to, you know, do, whether it's walking around or whatever. We could discuss here, and we'll just, we'll stay right here for that hour. How about I give you, how about I give you 25 minutes? That'll work. Does 25 minutes work? All right. Which group wants to go first? You want them to go for you're volunteering? Yeah, yeah, we'll go first. We'll do that way. All right. All right. So the assignment was to think about the case study at the beginning of the chapter on Walmart and corporate social responsibility and make the connection to theory. So this course is about integrating your theoretical foundations with the practical, concrete examples that are provided in terms of um, case studies in the book. And I think that this one is one that, in particular, is a good case study for this kind of class because we all can relate, because we've all been to Walmart. And how many of you absolutely hate going to Walmart? Depends on the time of the day. You love Walmart. I am so fine with Walmart. I don't know why everyone hates it. It depends on the time of the day. I'm not going to hurry. I'm going to hurry. I hate it. Walmart is fun to people. Oh, no. They just have anything that I need. I know Walmart's got it. It's like the problem. Anything that's going to be pretty cheap. Walmart's got it. Anything that's going to be pretty cheap. Good price. Well, Walmart's got it. Good price. And it's going to be pretty good price. One of the things that most people don't realize now is that Walmart is the largest retailer of. What do you think would be surprising to find out that Walmart's the largest retailer of? What item? Clothes. Tires. No, I don't think it's surprising that they're the largest retailer of clothes at all. I mean, they've got a huge uh, textile section. Was that something weird? It's what? Um, they are a huge retailer of guns. They're the largest retailer in the world of diamonds. What? They are the. They are now the number one retailer in the world. Of Who said diamonds? Like You've had my class. Witness. Maybe. You, you need to, well, had, you need to speak in, up louder. The guy in negotiation last year came in. He was a, I can't remember what. From Michael's Jewelry or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. Guy. And he was talking to him. I almost care okay. for that one. All right. So what did you guys come up with in the, since your teammates, or your, not your teammates, your, your <laughs> classmates volunteered you to talk uh, to Overall, we thought they were unethical. Yeah. Um, of course, there was the small ethical side of them, you know, wanting to contribute to society by being sustainable. Um, but my portion in particular about their labor costs, um, they seem to try and, you know, really cut down on that by trying to hire more young workers than older so they can avoid health care costs. Um, and then one thing I saw is the overtime. They tried to, you know, make people work overtime and not pay them as well. Um, and then with uh, women, they uh, they just don't treat them as fairly. It's, it's harder for them to move up in management compared to you know men. That's what I read at least. Um, so I guess it. Yeah, um, I guess how we tied it into like the actual ethical theories. Um, what I put is um, according to World Press, act utilitarianism is an ethical theory that affirms that an act is morally right if it maximizes utility for both parties. So after doing some research and after reading the case study, I mean, yeah, it kind of makes them seem like a good and ethical company does because it does talk about charities. But when you kind of actually do a little bit more research and actually kind of look inside, they do do a lot of unethical things to their employees and their workers. So it was kind of like they do more harm than they do good. 
And so that's where we said that they're not a utilitarian company. How do you, again, this is one of the problems with act utilitarianism, is how do you do the calculus on what's the overall uh, net harm or net benefit that they have to society? So you're using, if you use act utilitarianism, mm -hmm. you'd say you, you do the act which produces the overall net good. Well, let's think about one act. So there are multiple acts that, that are yeah. engaged in Walmart's activities. Mm -hmm. Everything from logistics to their advertising. Mm -hmm. But I think the one that most people focus on is what they're known for, which is everyday low prices. They are the everyday low price but that provider. But means everyday low wages for their workers, though. Right. But overall, if you just did it in terms of volume of sales, mm -hmm. aren't we all, I mean, happier? There are far more people that go to Walmart, I mean, if we just did numbers of people, mm -hmm. there are far more people that go to Walmart than work there. Mm -hmm. And so aren't we overall happier because I'm able to stretch <coughs> that dollar a lot further than I would be if I had to go someplace like Target or uh, another grocery store chain? I mean, I guess, I mean, kind of like you said, it is a hard point to argue, but I mean, then, I don't know, I mean, I just feel like, I mean, us saving a dollar, I think it does more harm to the people that can't afford to support their families off of their low wages. Like, I think my, me stretching my dollar, like that benefit, like they're, they're harmed, like by getting low wages and not being able to provide for themselves and like Walmart tries to cut corners and not provide them with health care and all that stuff. And so, I mean, it gave several different like specific examples and like them doing that, I think that's more harm than me saving a dollar. I yeah, but is. they are able to get health care, aren't well, they? Well, they can, but one of the outside sources that we're looking at, it gave several different examples of how they do cut corners, and they, they do deny, and they were sued, I think, 4,000 times last year, just in that aspect alone. And so I don't know if you, I don't know, if, uh, I don't remember if the case study in this version of the textbook talks about it, but what is one of the ways that Walmart uh, does get health care for their people? Um, they only hire young people, so that way they don't really have to. Is that what you're talking about? No. No. Uh, so they have directly <coughs> targeted younger workers, so they don't have to provide as many health care benefits. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, that's a maybe a legitimate strategy in terms of cutting your health care costs. The younger your workforce is, the less likely you are to use. I mean, the way insurance works is it's a pooling of risk, and so you have uh, a at the end of the year, what will happen is when you go out to bid, based on the usage rate that your company has, they will either get better or worse rates for the next year based on the cost that the group had. The younger the group is, statistically speaking, generally, the, the less cost they have and so the greater uh, benefits they're able to provide at a lower dollar volume. And of course, the savings are then passed on to the consumer. But the other way that Walmart actually was doing it was, and I don't remember again if it was in this case study, they actually told their people, even though we, you don't qualify for benefits with us because you're part-time, this was before the Affordable Health Care Act was fully implemented, you do qualify for what? Medicaid. So those people do qualify for, in many instances, Medicaid. So in essence, what Americans are doing is subsidizing Walmart's employment practices, even if you don't shop at Walmart, because who pays the bill? Who foots the bill for Medicaid? We do. The taxpayer does. Would you all have? Nothing. I just you brought up the whole well. You made a point, and then you defeated your my previous argument because you're not saving money if I'm paying taxes for their workforce. So really, it's just this was my whole side of the utilitarian approach. How it's unethical. You're essentially most of Walmart employees are on social programs because of their low wages. That essentially you're really not saving money. It just kind of bites you with taxes later. So I mean, you know, are you really saving money? But what's the? Uh, how do you calculate the amount in terms of? You know, I mean, the, the connection between what I'm paying in taxes and what it's costing for that one Walmart employee is, in, it's de minimis. I mean, it's a de minimis amount, 
right? Yeah. And so, am I? I mean, you're spreading again. You're still spreading the risk over a wider number of people, and overall, aren't you creating maybe just as much or more happiness? I mean, the amount of money that I pay in my taxes that goes to that one Walmart or that, or even their whole pool of employees that are eligible for Medicaid is, it's just, it's nothing. Well, yeah, but it's, it's not only that. I mean, like in the article, it says that a lot of them qualify for like food stamps and other type of government social programs and stuff like that. So, I mean, essentially, you're still just paying for the Medicaid, you're paying for a lot of stuff. And so, I mean, although, you know, most of these people could probably go out and if Walmart were to, you know, raise their wages, for example, this is a raise price on the products, but, you know, now you're not having to pay as much in taxes versus, because Walmart is one of the largest, if not the largest employer in several countries. It's like 45 to 50 states. So, I mean. It's the largest private employer in the United States. Yeah. So, I mean, when you think about it, most of your money's going to their employees anyways. If but look at this. Wouldn't we pay more for those people? on social benefits if they didn't have that job. One of the things that happened, so when I was growing up as a kid, one of the things that would happen was that if you were on welfare, you actually got penalized because they started t reducing benefits if you made money. So there was an incentive for you not to work. When Bill Clinton came into office, he realized and he said, and this is one of the things that's been somewhat controversial is that he realized that he was not going to be an old time, and this is way before most of you even remember. You don't remember the Clinton presidency for most of you. I was in high school when Clinton, I, I, I graduated the year that Clinton was elected to the White House. And old style democratic policies had become enormously unpopular as people said things, and Ronald Reagan talked about and railed against the welfare queen that he said was this woman who was riding around in a Cadillac and you know living the high life while drawing food stamps and AFDC, AFIDC and WIC and all of these other programs. And so what Clinton did was he said, we're not going to have just give me's anymore. We're going to have, we're going to tie it into promoting socially beneficial policies. So it's a hand up, not a hand out. And so you had people that then said, well, I can't make it if you take away my benefits. So they started doing this thing where you were eligible for some benefits like Medicaid and you went to work. And aren't we all better off? And aren't those people better off if they go to work than if they just sit there and draw a check? Yeah, our, I mean, we're getting some productivity. I used to have a colleague here whose name was Russell Jones, and I, I wish you all had actually gotten to take Dr. Jones. He was, he was one of our living pieces of history in the marketing department. He had been an Air Force colonel, and he flew Air Force Two. That was his job in the Air Force when he retired. So he flew the vice president. The last person he flew was Spiro T. Agnew, who was the vice president that was indicted and went to prison under Richard Nixon. So I mean, that's at least a, an interesting story, right? But he also flew Alexander T. Haig, who had been the supreme allied commander in Europe and under NATO, in NATO and had gone on to become secretary of state. And Russ was famous for saying, no worky, no eaty. He was a, he was a staunch Republican, and he would say, I believe that we ought to help people out, but they've got to work for it. So aren't we better off if they have a job than if they're just sitting? If they didn't have the job at Walmart, what would they be doing? Drawing work from WIC? Yeah, and, and not getting any. We wouldn't be getting any benefit out of it. So aren't we overall happier that we don't have the person standing in front of us in line just absolutely living off the government? but they are providing some useful benefit? I mean, yeah. What? I said, yeah, I mean, they obviously have a job, but I mean, I don't know, I don't have a point for that one. Wouldn't you pay more if, if they didn't have the job? Yeah, yeah, you would. Okay, so aren't we all overall happier? Yeah. I think we're, I think we're overall happier. I get cheap goods, you get, cheap goods, they get a job, that, 
probably contributes to their self-esteem, doesn't it? Their psychological goods, rather than just sitting at home drawing a check. And aren't we all better off? I can't, I, well, I, can't, I can't argue against something I don't agree with. Of course we're better off. I love I love child labor. I love getting my Nike shoes cheap. I love outsourcing. It's all great because I get it for cheap. Of course I love it. Now I'm not going to argue against that. I tried. <laughs> okay. I, I was going to say, well, well, our group is large enough that we kind of platooned this, so we put two people in everything. We have pros and cons. For okay, so let's hear, let's hear your duty. arguments. So, uh, duties up. This reminds me of the debate they would have. <laughs> when Trump's talking about Trump. Yeah, Trump. Yeah, Trump. Yeah, Trump. 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 Try again yeah. with that. Okay, <laughs> four duty. You had four duty. What? Oh, you were against. Sorry. I was against. Oh, oh God. God. No. Why don't we go to British graphics? Because uh, it's the kind of thing we do. He's at four. We're good. I know. Yeah. All right. Who Great. wants to start with your arguments for your group? <laughs> No, you already threw that group. You you threw that group under the bus. It's your turn, and and you you piped up. We got our force. Go ahead, man. Is this where you all start crumbling? That started. It's been a long time coming. We ain't making her channel all fucked. Oh. Okay. Just do that against me. The only thing that I really found that was against it was. Yeah, we walk into Walmart and we pay cheaper prices for shrimp or whatever. This is a gym I use. Probably the cheapest shrimp we can find in Edmond. But the reason is because somebody else worked their ass off in Louisiana for not as much wages for multiple hours. Probably a younger kid down there that's in poverty. And then Walmart just pays them really cheap for that. Okay, so what theory is it that you're using that's saying that that's unethical? Okay, so what's the duty? You didn't agree with it. Okay, so it's uh, so I think uh, I read the intro. Within, <laughs> within the duty, uh, you know, the question really becomes: Is Walmart's duty towards society as a whole, or within Walmart's power structure? And uh, the way I perceived it was, uh, you know, the duty is more uh, towards you know the consumers shareholders and not so much the employees and the suppliers because it seems like their preference is you know take care of where the money is being made and not so well yeah where the money's coming in and not so much where the money's going out too. Okay so what you're saying is that you and you've identified one of the problems with duty ethics. So one of the problems with duty ethics is how are we going to ascertain these duties? Where where are we going to get them? Now Kant gives us a pretty good formulation of where we're going to ascertain the duties. But one of the things that he doesn't give us, and, ask, and I think he gives us a pretty good way of determining what those duties are. We should act in such a way as to, in every instance that we deal with another rational human being, we should treat that rational human being as, a, as an end in and of themselves. But what happens when you have more than one rational being, right? Now you're, now you're dealing with not just one person, but you're dealing with the consumer. So how do you determine which duty is greater? And that's one of the problems. And so what you're saying is what we should do is we should assign a greater value to the duty that we owe to the consumer rather than the duty that we owe to the employee. Is that what you're telling me? I, I think that's where Walmart is, is coming from. That's the way they think. Okay, they have a greater duty to their customer than they do to their employee. Yes. Because ultimately it's the customer who will determine what the share price is. Right. Okay. That, I, that seems to me then... To be a more utilitarian argument, actually, I than a duty argument. Why? Because the greater benefit for everybody, which would be the consumers. There's more consumers than there is workers. Okay. I think that's right. I think it's a utilitarian. I think it's a utility. You, you, you can sacrifice some in a utilitarian world for the greater good. Okay. If you are, if you have control of the dam and there is a huge flood, and you can sacrifice 100 people in a small community versus the city of Los Angeles by flooding them out and averting potential disaster in the dam collapse, 
<coughs> who do you choose? Well, a utilitarian would say you flood them. And that's, I mean, basically what Walmart does is says, look, there's this huge population over here. That's, that's what we're going to serve because that's the greater good. Aren't we all overall better if we have those lower prices? I think you can make a perfectly logical argument that that's acceptable. Anybody do virtue? You did, okay, you did a virtue perspective. What's your <coughs> virtue argument? Mm -hmm. um, mine was against, sorry, no, was for. Was for? So I had the child legal thing, <coughs> and a lot of people don't agree with that. I, I feel that I agree with it, because maybe third world countries like uh, Walmart employs uh, Bangladeshi's kids in Bangladesh. Like, if, if they don't work, they don't have food on the table. So even though we employ them, it may seem harsh, but to them, they, they have money. I mean... And it teaches them hard work, doesn't it? Right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, that, that isn't, and isn't that virtuous? Hard, hard labor. That, that's a virtue. Okay. I mean, I work a lot as a kid. I get paid. Just saying. Like... Rich economy like the, the America would feel like it's a bad thing, but I think third world countries like China maybe or uh, Bangladesh, Vietnam, they would appreciate it, even though it's hard work, less salary or something. Yeah, it's relative, isn't it? Right. I mean, one of the things that happens is that. What constitutes a living wage in the United States is radically different than what constitutes a living wage in some place like Mexico. And it's one of the reasons why people, before Mexico became a hotbed of criminal activity on the border, when I got my PhD at New Mexico State in Las Cruces, you could look from my office across the border into Mexico. And in Juarez, which is right across the border from El Paso, there were 2,000, the last year I was there at, at State, there were 2,000 murders that year in what is in Mexico. So it's a radically different perspective than what you have in the third or in the first world, where you expect you know that kids have video games and cell phones and <coughs> iPods for all, right? I mean that's that's radically different, and. It does teach, I mean, you know, child labor does, it teaches a virtue. It, life's hard, you gotta work. Something that America, maybe, maybe we would all be better off if we put you all to work at an earlier age. My yeah. manual labor days are just about over. Thank you much. Your, your manual labor days are just about over? Yeah. I've been okay. mowing lawns, working on cars, and laying asphalt my entire life. I'm ready to graduate. That's why we're in school. Yeah. That's exactly why you're here. <laughs> All right, so this, what did this group come up with? So we did a different angle than maybe everyone else. We did, um, we applied the moral minimum. Okay. Um, basically what we said is uh, Walmart is kind of in the middle. They're not necessarily completely unethical, but they're not necessarily all the way ethical um, in the aspect of just different examples that we gave and we can talk about them. But um, the three that we did, we said partially um, ethical with moral minimum theory and <clears throat> with their workplace practices, uh, sustainability initiatives, and their philanthropic <laughs> contributions in the community is those three. Ones. Okay, so their workplace practices, ethical or not? <clears throat> Borderline. The border minimum. 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 It's minimum. Like, minimum. Yeah, I mean, Pick to get side. low prices, like we've all just discussed, I mean, it comes with consequence. I mean, low wages, all that stuff. Okay. So they're abiding by, like, the laws, and they're not necessarily okay, so that, doing all anything. All right, so let, let's put this, we could do a cost-benefit analysis. Basically. Since you guys did moral minimum, we could say cost and benefit, and do, so what's the cost? Okay, not happy. Yeah. All right. 
But other people are happy on the right. benefit yeah. side. But consumers happy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Low wages, cheap prices. Okay, low wages, cheap prices. So we can basically do double entry bookkeeping, and I bet we'd find debits and credits for all of them. <laughs> and and do, it, doesn't it balance out at the end? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about from a duty perspective? Are they following, you said they're following the law, yeah. and that's a more, that's, some people would say that's a moral minimum. I think that that's not necessarily a moral minimum. But how about this argument? They're allowing, I mean, nobody is forced to work for Walmart. Right. I mean, they're allowing you to make an autonomous decision. You can either work for Walmart or not. Yeah. I mean, they're not violating your autonomy. No. Are they going above and beyond no. and, and providing you with meaningful work? I don't know. Should they? But, I mean, and that's their perspective. It's like, we're trying to make a business here. This is our market. This is kind of our niche. And right. Not it every, is what it is. And not everybody can have meaningful work, can they? Right. I mean, somebody's, gotta, somebody's going to have Someone's to. Someone's got to pick up the trash. So yeah. Like, that's the, kind of their viewpoint. Right. But it's, it's a product of your own free choice whether or not you work there. Now, other people would say it's really not a product of your free choice. If, you, if that's the only employer that you can go to work for, then aren't you sort of stuck? Well, could you work for them and then continue to look for their job? Sure, absolutely. So, <coughs> and was it, was it your own fault that that's the only person you can work for? Is it? It is. It is if you have for businesses out of a small town. Yeah. You can move. Can you really? But how much the burden financially is that? If you're poor, can you move? Exactly. You know? It's hard to make it out of the project. <laughs> it's hard to make it out of the project. All right. So we have one other group. Is that right? Do we have? Is there just four groups in here? Is that right? Four. One mega group, three normal groups. One mega group. We're taking it. Okay. Um, I would say that they have actually infringed on duty-based ethics, which is in relation to the law. Um, they have been sued for not paying overtime wages to employees in over nine states. And okay, now that is, that's clearly, I mean, I think you clearly have a duty. You have a duty to pay people a fair wage. And there is a law that actually backs up that duty. It's called the Fair Labor Standards Act, which says you can't work for free. Right. And it's one of the things that's actually been most difficult. Businesses used to come in in the olden days, when I first started teaching here in the dark ages, businesses would come and they would say, do you have people that want to do an internship? And we had all kinds of internships. And guess what? Those internships weren't paid, usually. Now, almost all of our internships in the College of Business are paid because the DOL came up with a rule that says you can do a pure internship if the internship is solely for the benefit of the intern and the business would not hire somebody to do that job if they didn't have the, in other words, if you basically do nothing but shadow somebody, you can do an internship. But if the business would have to pay somebody for that position, it has to be a paid internship. And we still have businesses to this day that come and say, don't you have somebody who just wants to work for the experience? And I'm like, no, uh, no, not really. Our students don't do that. And, it, and it's actually a violation of the DOL rules. So you can't actually do that. You can't get people to work for free. It's, it's a violation of the law. And I think that's something that we should consider. OK, what else? Um, uh, one of the big things that really, really stuck out to our group was the fact that 70% of Walmart's employees are females. And since they are the largest employer in the world, you would ex or, yeah, and private employer anyways, uh, you would expect to see, you know, a pretty large number of females in management positions, but 90% of management positions are held by males, while 70% of the total employee population is females. So that doesn't really add up, because I can't imagine with that many female employees that you're not having at least an equivalent number of female and males with drive initiation and qualification to hold those positions. <coughs> Um, is that disproportionate to other companies, though? Mm. I mean, what you'll find Probably is that not. you'll find, in many instances, you will find disproportionately uh, management is comprised of males. Would you say that's partially like personality because a female driver, like personality type, is not going to come across the same way as a male driver personality? 
I would say that historically it's because there have been less opportunities, and so women have historically been pigeonholed into other types okay. of roles. One of the things, I can give you an example. One of the things that it used to be very common was that there were certain professions that were, that were identified with uh, either being a male role or a female role, and you didn't sort of cross them. I had a professor when I was going through my undergraduate who had a PhD in political science, and she said, you know, when I went to school at OU, and this is not that long ago, she told them she wanted to be a political scientist, and the advisor said, women are either nurses or teachers. Which do you want to be? Because you can't major in political science. And she said, okay, I'll be a nursing major. And she went all the way through her career at OU as a nursing major while taking political... And she said, I knew that if I got the requirements for the degree, they couldn't deny me the degree. But they were not going to let me say that, declare my major. I mean, her advisor was just adamant that she was not going to be able to declare her major as political science. And so she went all the way through her undergraduate career in nursing and got a degree in political science. So she did that? No. She just said that she was a nursing major and never took a nursing course <laughs> and ended up as a political scientist. So, I mean, you could say that there's been this historic reason why there were fewer women that were eligible for management roles because they didn't have necessarily the, the ability. Now that women have entered the workforce in equal numbers or greater numbers than men. There are more women in law school now than there are men in law school. There are more women in medical school now than there are men because there are more women in the population than there are men. You should start to see that balance shift. And so you could say when Walmart started that there were obviously more men that were capable of fulfilling management roles because they had the management training, but you should start to see that proportion change as greater and greater numbers of females are qualified and have the management experience for that position. But is that what Walmart does? Are they promoting women to the same extent that they do? Yes, we'll find out. Time will tell type of deal. Okay. Um, and then uh, one that's personally like something that I care about uh, as far as the utilitarian goes, uh, it said that Walmart, you know, with their extreme buying power, has the ability by, if not choosing a supplier, could completely shut that supplier down because of how much quantity that um, Walmart suppliers are tasked with if they choose those suppliers. Um, but they put uh, the suppliers into bidding wars that drive the prices out extremely low. But when you drive the prices that low, you also drive the quality down. And so I would say utilitarian-wise, as a society, we're really not better off paying the cheap prices for products because of all of the GMOs and GMSs in our food at Walmart. Um, I mean, you can't hardly get anything as far as um, bread products are concerned. I mean, they have a small wheat section and a small gluten-free section and things like that. But for the most part, our food system, uh, because of Walmart and McDonald's, have geared the food to be created fast and in unsavory un practices. I don't know if you have <coughs> watched Food Incorporated, but like the way that they grow the chickens nowadays, they have to go through 40 chemical baths just to make sure that the chicken meat's clean because of the way they grow them and uh, the living conditions that the chickens are kept within and the way they're fed. So, right, okay, so you, you've, got a whole lot, you've got a whole lot of stuff there that we're going to have to unpack. One of the things that I think is interesting is people rail against genetic modification, genetically modified food. In the strictest sense of the word, isn't selective breeding gen genetic modification? I mean, fair enough. But I mean, why why is why is genetic GMO genetically modified organism? Why is that inherently <coughs> bad? Partially because uh, farmers used to could keep their seed uh, and replant, you know, the seed that did, you know fell along the way that didn't, you know flower into a wheat crop or some other kind of crop, but they can no longer keep 
their seed because say one of the farmers up the stream is using GMOs from Monsanto, if that seed washes down and gets into your crop and they find And you that, didn't pay Monsanto for it. And you didn't pay Monsanto for it and they caught you keeping seed and you have some of their seed, you can be sued and basically have your farm shut down. They've almost killed the private farming industry. Yeah, but that's that, owning life. That's called patents, right? But you can't have a patent on life. You, can't you know, shouldn't be able to have a patent on life, but I mean, it, I don't know, I find it odd that farmers cannot sustain the practices they've used for basically since farming began by keeping their, their own seeds to, to replenish and replant the next season. Well, I mean, that's violative. When you buy from Monsanto and you buy their product, you agree to the contractual terms. You had the ability to negotiate freely, didn't you? Right, but some farmers, because they're downstream from their partners who are buying from Monsanto, even if they aren't buying from Monsanto, if that seed washes down and is found in their seeds, mm -hmm. they never had any kind of contract with Monsanto, but they can still be sued and have their farm taken away, whether or not they're in a contractual agreement with Monsanto or not, simply because Monsanto's seed ended up in their field. Would it combine with their own seed Absolutely. to make a... It makes someone of a hybrid plant or can. A mutant um, gene, whatever. But it's not necessarily the plant that's the problem. It's the fact that Monsanto has the ability to shut down private industry or private, I'd say organization, but private farms if, if their seed is washed down the stream and ended up in that farmer's stockpile of seed for the next planting season. Okay. But one of the things that I think that we have to acknowledge is that progress moves on. And that's not necessarily, I mean, that people resist change. And one of the things that we have this idealized image of is the American or the family farmer in this country. And in fact, Willie Nelson has done for years and years and years a concert called Farm Aid that's supposed to help the, the family farmer. Just like when Mitt Romney said in the debate against President Obama, we have decimated the military because we don't have the same number of uh, ships that we used to have in our military arsenal. President Obama said, that's right, Mitt, and we also don't have the same number of bayonets and, you know, uh, people marching around because that's not the way we fight wars anymore. We don't fight wars by putting people with, you know, he said, we've, we've also decreased the number of other than for ceremonial purposes in the Marines, our soldiers aren't carrying around a sword and scabbard and a, and a bayonet on a, on a gun. We don't, we don't farm on 50 acres and a mule anymore. And it's not feasible to continue to think that you're going to. I mean, if you want to have a gentleman farm so that you can raise heirloom tomatoes and stuff like that. That's probably, and you want to do it because that's the way it is. That, that, that's the way you want to do your own thing, but realizing you're not going to make any money at it, that's okay. But combines, what does a, what does a large implement of farm machinery cost now? What is, a, what is a combine? When I was a kid growing up on a cattle ranch, you know, tractors and stuff like that were fairly cheap. I mean, what's what's a combine now? Four hundred to a million. Yeah, a million dollars. Yeah. You know, this is this is not, and they're again now becoming more and more mechanized. We're not going to farm that way. And economists would say that's just the way things are, right? That that that's progress. We also don't ride around in a horse and buggy, and aren't we all better off? One of the things that has happened, and maybe this is a bad thing, for the first time in human history, we now have more obese people in the United States than we have starving people. They've got pizza listed as a vegetable so they can sell it in schools right. for school lunches. But so aren't we all better off? Aren't we all better off with more food than less? Aren't we better off not starving to death? Maybe a little less cheese. A little less cheese. Well, <laughs> they put cheese on everything, and it's like I'm all for that. One. That's <laughs> America. That's calcium. Uh, um, 
And it, the only reason is because people started asking for milk with less fat, so they started turning the fat into cheese, and now they just sell the hell out of cheese. And isn't that great? It's a, it's a wonderful protein source that's... that's cheese is utilitarian. That's cheese easily kept. <laughs> cheese is just like anything. Only in proper quantity is it actually a viable source for uh, a healthy part of your diet. If you... Uh, how do you... How, what's the saying? The, um, in excess. Doing anything in excess is not uh, recommended. They say wine is fine, having a glass of wine with dinner, but drinking the whole bottle with dinner every evening might be a little rough on your system. Yeah. Yeah. You know, all, all that matters is that you're happy. <laughs> you're yeah. to I mean, I guess we're all going to die in a hundred degrees, so... All right, all right, you're done. You're done. You're done. Yeah, all right. No, so, I mean, I, 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 I think that, you know, we, we've, got, we've got moderation and balance, don't we, now? I mean, the, the amount of obese people in the United States, I would say we don't. Is it better that people have a little bit too much than they're starving to death? Which would you rather err on the side of? That's the heavy side. I'm angry when I'm starving, so <laughs> I'd rather be I'd rather be full. I think we're I think we're in the wrong country for talking about, you know, eating healthy. Maybe there, what you don't like everything better? Cheese. There, there was bacon wrap. There was bacon, bacon wrapped corn on the cob at the fair. So, yes. You know, I, I don't think chocolate covered I bacon. Dip that in cheese, honey. Deep, deep fat fried bacon. I had, I had a fried Snickers and it was delicious. It made me happy. So I don't, you know. <laughs> aren't, aren't we all better off? So you got genetically modified. What was your other argument now? Uh, uh, he just hit me with the bottle of wine. Uh, I was, that was the main one. I mean, I know, personally, my family sources our chicken and beef from a private farm, uh, and it's been shown to be extremely cleaner than the chemical-bathed chicken you can buy at Walmart. So, well, it's not just it's not just that the chickens have to be bathed because they sit in chicken feces. They're also bred again to plump up really quickly, well, get fat, and almost like pure antibiotics or probiotics throughout their entire life. I mean, it's like an eight-week life, and they grow three times the size of a normal chicken. It's kind of Franken chicken. What's wrong with that? I don't know. I mean, it's like you, you've got you now. We've got more chicken, aren't we all? The, the welfare and Medicaid <laughs> weight that the large populace has put onto the system. I mean, with heart issues being like the number one killer in America, and heart issues are laid, linked directly to what you eat or hereditary. Most of the time, it's what you eat. That's don't you have to blame that on the person who eats it, though? I mean, I mean, absolutely, it's their fault. But who's carry, who's carrying the weight of that with taxes on Medicare and Medicaid and, and the Obamacare and all of that? Again, this is one of the problems with utilitarianism: is how are we going to do that calculus? I, I, I mean, how do you how do you do it? Uh, they actually did a study. Harvard did a study that showed that smoking was actually beneficial because although smokers have a huge amount of health care costs. They're all at the end, and it's a very short period of time. Whereas people who are healthier have long term, they have a lot more health care costs in terms of they have to have that hip replaced. You know, you, you live a long time, and why, if you're a smoker and you die at 45, there ain't no hip replacement for you. There's no knee replacement for you. That's killer so quickly as possible. It's creepy. three bottles of wine. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what we should do. You know, I mean that that was what they that was their their you know their conclusion was that it actually was a net social benefit because those people one of the reasons that and and I asked students this as we think about the debate on the state of our economy one of the big things that the candidates are going to talk about is. Well, at least one of the candidates is going to talk about this idea of the actuarially unsound nature of Social Security. And how are we going to fix that problem? As people are living longer, the reason that Social Security came into being and the idea was, and the reason that they set the age at 65 was because people generally died around 65. And so, you know, it was like, well, you'd retire and you would draw it at 65 for a couple of years, and then you would go. And you know you had enough workers in the workforce 
to sustain, because Social Security is not about a retirement plan in terms of you are paying in what you will take out. You will take out far more than you pay in, but the thing that made it sound was that you wouldn't take out that much for that length of time and that there would be enough workers below you to support and sustain the system. Well, we've become top-heavy because we're all living a lot longer. I mean, the, the people are not dying at 65, and so they're retiring at 65 and drawing Social Security for years and years and years, and how are we going to deal with that? Well, there are a number of ways that we can deal with it to make Social Security actuarially sound. We could encourage people to smoke and die quicker, right? And that's one, I, I, don't think that's, I don't think that's really what we should do, but that's certainly what the conclusion of the study was, is that it was overall net beneficial if people died faster. We could also raise the rates on Social Security over the cap, so when you get the FICA, <coughs> amount on your Social Security check, most of you have not topped out. But if you make over $250,000 a year, at some point that will drop off of your check during the pay year because there's a cap on it. We could raise that cap. And that would be one thing that we could extend the life of Social Security while not increasing the benefits. Of course, people have problems saying, you know, I paid for it, I should get uh, a bigger benefit. But these are issues that we're going to have to, to face, and I think trying to do the calculus becomes enormously problematic with that. Um, we're about out of time, so we'll finish talking about corporate social responsibility on Tuesday. We'll talk about theories of marketing and how they tie into the development, I think, of corporate social responsibility. And then we'll move into corporate culture and governance. So start reading for uh, Tuesday. Um, and Thursday of next week, read chapter four on corporate culture and governance. Me and uh, Chris are going to.